Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock. I'm the founder of Humanist Learning Systems, um, author of the book Applied Humanism, and a board member for the International Humanistic Management Association. I want to welcome you today to our Humanistic Management Professionals Lunch and Learn, and I'd like to introduce my co-host, Elizabeth. Elizabeth? Hmm. Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Elizabeth Castillo out at Arizona State University and also on the board of the International Humanistic Management Association. Uh, we, have a, we have a lot of new people with us today, uh, so I wanted to give a quick overview of the International Humanistic Management Association, as well as our marketing partner, the International Leadership Association. The International Humanistic Management Association acts as a hub for researchers, practitioners, and policymakers inter interested in the promotion and practice of humanistic management and leadership. The practices of humanistic management honor the intrinsic value of all life and protect the dignity of all humans. The practices are oriented towards flourishing of all life and the enhancement of human well being. Humanistic management differs from traditional mechanistic or economic practices in that humans are more than resources, stakeholders, assets, or capital. Human beings are the means and the end, and the purpose of business is to serve human flourishing rather than wealth creation. You can learn more about us at humanisticmanagement.international. That's our website. Now, we have a marketing partner today, and we're very excited about this collaboration. This is the first time we've done this. Our marketing partner is the International Leadership Association, and I want to welcome everyone from that organization who's joining us today. We're glad to have you. The International Leadership Association is the largest worldwide community dedicated to leadership, scholarship, education, and development, and you can learn more about them at ilaglobalnetwork.org. Our guest today is Randall Joy Thompson. She is an international development professional who writes on leadership, commenting in the arts. She has traveled the globe as a US aid foreign service officer and then as a consultant and is facilitating dream making better futures through her social network, Dream Connect Global. And she has a new book, Proleptic Leadership of the, on the Commons, Ushering in a New Global Order. Um, so, and we will include links to that and what, cause we record this and then we put it up on the website. We'll include links to that um, in the documentation that we provide. So welcome Randall. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks Jennifer and Elizabeth for inviting me. And as I am sharing my screen, I have a, a brief PowerPoint just to kind of put down some of the takeaways for you to have later. Um, I would like to acknowledge the co-editors um, of the new book that's coming out on September 29th, and that is um, called Reimagining Leadership on the Commons, Shifting the Paradigm for a More um, Ethical, Equitable, and Just Future. And I would like to acknowledge Kathleen Quinn, who's one of the co-editors, she's a call, and also Devin Singh, I think, who's been able to join us and also acknowledge all of the um, authors who are here today, including Elizabeth, and I see Pat Clary out there and perhaps others will be joining. Um, I would like to um, give some takeaways. I think I'm just going to give takeaways for about 15 minutes and then we're going to open it up for questions, which should be interesting. I'm taking most of what I'm saying from the future book, the book that's coming out in September, but it also really does parallel a lot of what I talk about in my own book, Proleptic Leap Upon the Commons. Great, so, your, your PowerPoint's um, not open I'm yet. I'm sharing just... my screen. You're sharing the screen, but the PowerPoint's okay. not open yet. Somehow I can't even see it. I don't know what's going on. I can't see my PowerPoint. Oh. <laughs> my goodness. Let's see what's going on here. Hmm. I wonder if it's because of the view somehow. It might be. Uh, if you change your I view, you might so. be able to see I it. I think I shouldn't be on the speaker view. Um, so sorry, everybody. You, you can try stopping to share your screen. And then when you do s select it again, select just the open. You need to open the PowerPoint and then share it. 
And you might want to exit full screen as well, because that's probably part of the problem. OK. Do you see it now? Or uh, No, there it is. It's coming up now. There we go. OK. All right. Now I can't. Sorry. OK, so again, I would. What I wanted to talk focus on, of course, is leadership on the commons and provide some takeaways for leaders of all types of organizations. I think it's important, first of all, to start by giving a definition of the commons because this has been a, a very contested concept. Um, and I think that one of the most definitions probably is the best all the aspects of the commons. And so they're defined as social systems comprised of self-organized communities of commoners who create and or use and or protect and or share natural human made or abstract commonwealth or resources governed and sustained and sustained by the practice of commoning, which infuses the community with distinctive values, processes and actions that differ from those of the, the state and the private sector. And there's a brief little video on the website of the International Association for the Study of the Commons that kind of also summarizes one of the latest conceptions. I want to present before the, the takeaway, what are some of the values of the commons, which I talk about in my book and which the authors of our new book also talk about. And that is its commons are based on the relational ontology. The assumption is that humans are cooperative, not individualistic by nature, and that our identity is formed in relationship, not anyway by ourselves alone. So relationships also with the more than human are foundational to our identity. Care and obligation to others and the more than human are foundational to our ethics. Communal welfare and sharing are our overall concern. <clears throat> Autonomy is the major incentive for becoming a commoner to have more control over our basic needs and one's life. Um, we're, we have the desire to create life that matters and we have a consciousness that's ecocentric rather than egocentric. And we support the values of open systems. <clears throat> so what are the implications then for um, oops, sorry, leadership on the commons and shifting the paradigm. Again, my book is all about shifting the paradigm for leadership and the authors of the book that's coming out in, on chapter 29th also talks about the main focus of the book is shifting the paradigm. Well, what does that mean? How, what are the foundations of shifting the paradigm? <laughs> Hmm. That's leadership into creating a more positive, equitable, full and just view all must incorporate the values of humans, which I went over, must be able to see complexities. I mean, we all know that the world um, is increasing in complexity and there's been a lot of talk about the world and how can we start to see these complexities and take them into account in our leadership. Uh, we must have a broad view of the human and non-human world. We must really have a complex adaptive whole systems view in order to be able to see and incorporate the complexity of the world into our leadership. And we our leader must encourage positive change for all of humanity and to look at as inspirations leadership. So, okay, the first step, is we argue that we need to shift our worldview. We can't change our leadership. And we think that the co leadership of commons or commons leadership really provides an interesting approach that might also help other organizations, uh, governmental organizations, private sector organizations, NGOs, so um, we start with that we need to expand our worldviews and consciousness so that we can perceive larger whole complex systems. Our worldview is really bio-inspired. We look at nature as an inspiration for our leadership. 
and we look at um, creating regenerative whole systems, which definitely are modeled after the way systems in nature act. We need an adaptive and not a control perspective. And what I like to refer to what Elizabeth Castillo calls the need for allostasis, not some homeostasis. Basically, um, leadership has been based on homeostasis up to creating stability at a moment in time, maintaining operational variables to within a, a control, but it's not the way we should work to deal with um, complexity. We need adaptive. And so we have to look your ship as an allo, as a process maintaining stability through dynamic change. And that's definitely in accord with the complexity of the world. Um, as one of our authors, Kathleen Allen proposes, we need to reproduce regenerative process in organizations. Much like nature, late nature is a regenerative process. Shift from an egocentric attitude of dominance to an ecocentric concern for the whole interconnected planet. As Kathleen Curran argues, we need an ecocentric model of what matters, something that's relational, responsible, and intentional with the ecocentric identity and spirit found in the intersection of these. I talk about in my book and also in a chapter in the new book is that leadership should be proleptic. Prolepsis is a concept of um, allowing the future glimpses to enter into your, your current reality <clears throat> so that somehow you're leading uh, with the glimpses of the future. And as I've talked about um, also, we're, it's inherent in humans somehow that we think that a, a better future's coming into existence. It's in our spiritual and religious traditions, all of them basically. And leading proleptically is somehow being open, opening yourself. And I have a whole process in my book um, about how you can op better open yourself to the future and how you see how you're influencing um, the levels of systems from individual to um, group to social, to environmental, to the universal, and how they're influencing you, your leadership process. And by doing this, it fits with this bio-inspired regenerative whole systems worldview. Um, the way we redefine relations also, and as I've said, this is based on a relational ontology, Ubuntu, as some of our authors talk about, and has become more and more popular the fact that um, I am because we are. So I just want to highlight some of the points that Elizabeth makes in her chapter that relations are really embedded in an interconnected system. So it goes beyond human relations as I've talked about before to the more than human. And there's a complexity of interdependent subsystems. And so the function of leadership really is to catalyze the flow of energy information and matter creating stabilizing connectivity and coherence among all of the substance and what said before really involves this is developing a higher level consciousness and awareness of complexity in the relations of things in our own relational processes. Um, mutualism is extremely important and it's pointed out in my book but also by a number of authors in our new book. And um, it's when both organisms in nature, when they benefit and create larger systemic benefits. So leaders really play this role. They help to form mutualistic relationships within and between organizations and with the more than human. And leadership needs to equitably include, inspire, engage, and facilitate change for all states human, not on human, not just shareholders. That's the way in prosper for the planet. Um, power is different in um, leadership, and this is an important takeaway, I think, that we, in uh, commons, leaders is power to rather than power over. It develops, developing their capabilities 
uh, to have power to rather than having power over them. Um, where it's leadership is empowering. It's a catalytic approach. It enhances the adaptive capacity by expanding degrees of freedoms and creates resonance. This is as um, Elizabeth points out in her chapter on commons leadership. Resources um, are much more expansive than normally considered. We consider all types of resources um, and commons leadership in, intentionally develops these diverse resources to strengthen capacity. And actually Elizabeth lists in her chapter some some approaches that can be used, community capital, capitals, aggregated reporting, the multi-capital scorecard that can actually be employed to develop these diverse resources. I'm, I'm going quickly, but I'll give you these after. Um, one thing in commons, and I think it's important in all organizations as a key takeaway that we need to sit down and determine our ethical principles. Since uh, the commons are, are um, self-organized <clears throat> um, communities of people, one of the key first things that they need to do is establish what are the ethical principles by which we want to interact. And I think this is really a key takeaway for all organizations. I think it's, it, it is useful in all organizations to more consciously consider what are our ethical principles? What are the values that we want to uphold within our organization and in the world? And Catherine Baird and the rest of her authors really um, define a, con a process of conscious conversation, which I think all organizations can take advantage of. It's uh, anchored by four key processes, including ethical sensitivity, spiritual depth, positive engagement, community responsiveness, where the leader and the members of the organization together solve problems, enables social and it has its qualities and behaviors contributing to common good. The, the authors of that chapter um, refer to benevolent leadership as regenerative, perhaps is the best way to sit down together and help um, have conscious conversations about these ethical principles. Um, Co-author of our new book, Kathleen Curran, talks about a corporate commons hybrid, which I think is very an unconventional, highly creative thinker. Um, looking at corporate commons hybrid, possibly one way that commons leadership can be infused in considering non-commons types organizations. And it's definitely founded on a broad human and non-human relational ontology. A shift from egocentric to ecocentric and responsible leadership. And it combines really the engine of corporations with concerns of commons for the well-being of all. And again, as I mentioned before, an ecocentric model of what matters. It's relational, responsible, and intentional with that ecocentric identity and spirit. And it equitably includes, inspires, engages, and facilitates change for the good of all stakeholders, not just shareholders. And she uses the example of the Patag of Patagonia. <clears throat> I would like to just add also in my book, I use a human action perspective to describe um, how proleptic leadership works, arguing that leadership connects all levels of our, our being in the world, our individual, our relational with um, others close to us, with our teams, with our communities, with our societies, with the environment, and with the universal. And by what universal, I draw on spiritual traditions and also on you know systems traditions, which shows that um, complexity is increasing, ha is increasing over a time that there is an evolutionary process going on at the universal level. The spiritual um, um, philosophies argue that um, consciousness is going through a process of expansion toward 
or cosmic, eventually a cosmic consciousness that we are moving as individuals more and more from an egocentric perspective to an ecocentric perspective, a world-centric perspective and a, um, a cosmic centric perspective. And as we do that, our own identity merges more with in relationships and with others. And this really does impact our, impact our leadership because we realize that we're not, you know, it's not an individual process, it's a relational process. It's um, something that inspires, engages, that everyone in fact, leader. Um, also, the prolep, a lot of traditions, we are in this um, mood for equitable world and somehow our role is to help lead the process of increasing equitability, increasing justice, increasing um, positive relationships pe between individuals. And so I think these basically are kind of the foundation of what I talk about in my book, what the authors talk about in the paradigm shift of the book coming out on September 29th, which reimagines leadership on the, on the commons and focuses on shifting the paradigm. And so shifting the paradigm, starting with our own worldview is critical. Hey, and Randall, I think, just yes. really quick, um, we're, we're coming to the end of the, the first part of yeah. this. So if I could get you to focus on like three practical takeaways, like what are the practical things people could do to implement this now? Like what are the three most important things people could do? And then we'll open up for questions. I think the most important things is examine your own perspective first. Um, worldview. How do you see the world? Do you look at your organization in a closed systems way? And um, therefore, that um, some argue that leads you only to look at your own shareholders, your own people that you directly influence, or do you look at broader stakeholders? Do you include the view of the world? So examine yourselves. What is your worldview? Number two, um, do you see the interconnections between your organization and other organizations? And do you take those into consideration um, in your processes, in your leadership approach? Do you include the more than human in your process, in the impact, how the more than human impacts you and your organization, how you every day and your organization impacts the more than human? And also, are you willing to really sit down and look at your ethical values? Are you willing to have a conversation about your views and determine you are really having a positive impact? And I just put three inspirational quotes on my last slide, but you can look at those later. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so I want to start out by asking a couple of questions and then we'll open it up to everyone else. If you have questions, I've seen people putting them in the chat. That's the right place for them. So if you have any questions, now is the time to put them in the chat. Um, so the first question I have is a common thing when you hear someone talk about the commons or leadership of the commons, and that is in the world of business, how is this different from socialism, right? Uh, so can you address how the leadership of the commons either relates to socialism or, you know, how would you answer that, that question? Oh, well, no, <laughs> no, actually leadership on the commons is very, very, very different than socialism. Socialism is when, uh, right, the government ha has more and more power. I mean, common leadership is just the opposite. <laughs> It's when people locally take more control over their lives because government has failed and because corporations only concern themselves with profit and they're enclosing more and more things. This is one reason the commons movement has become so popular because like it's getting more expensive to get access to clean water. It's getting more um, intolerable to get clean air. It's getting even information has been com um, has been commodified. It's very expensive to to get journal information. So this is uh, it, it's 
no. And I mean, commons are very different from state management and state governance. It's individuals having more autonomy and taking over more control of their lives that has been taken away by the state and by corporations. I don't know if that answers. No, it. that was really good. <laughs> I really, really like that because I was thinking too, you know, but no, you're right. It's the exact opposite of that. Um, so it's more of a democratic form of, of governance, basically, um, what you're describing. Yes, How, so one of the problems people have in leadership, right, especially in a collaborative leadership environment like what we're talking about here, is how do we address and how do groups address the problem of voluntary contributions, because what often happens is a few high, there's a usually a few highly engaged people and a lot less, a lot more less engaged people. So do you have any advice for people who are trying to lead in this sort of way, but are running into the problem of engagement? Right, this is, um, well, Eleanor Ostrom, who's really kind of the mother of the cost of the commons and she has governance principles that every commons really needs to think, sit down and, and reflect on these principles. It also goes with what Catherine Baird talks about, about sitting down and have conscious ethics. How are we going to work together? Um, yeah, it's a process of gaining commitment. You, you need to gain commitment. And Eleanor Ostrom talks about if you have commitment of individuals, then there are consequences of not meeting that commitment, which the group, um, agrees upon. So, um, but yeah, definitely there's always this a human trait that some people, you know, assume more responsibility. And, and I suppose people that are organizing commons and volunteer groups often are left with the burden, but it's, it's a process of really gaining commitment. And that's, a, I guess, a good leadership trait that we should talk about. How do you build commitment? Um, but uh, it is, as in volunteerism, it's an issue in commenting. And the whole issue of free riders that some people want to take advantage of the benefits without putting in their effort, which is why it's so important to agree upon your foundational values and ways of in governance principles. <laughs> So I want to follow up on that, uh, that concept of the, the freeloader, so to speak. Um, because that obviously comes up a lot in various public policy conversations and I'm sure it's not unique to the United States. It's probably everywhere. Why should I pay taxes for XYZ to do ZDB? <laughs> you know? um, and so do you have advice for individuals interested in, in a, a commons approach to how we respond to people concerned about the freeloaders, because I think in any commons, there will in fact be freeloaders. Um, but how do you, what's your advice? Yeah, this goes back to what I was just talking about, uh, about the principles of governance that Eleanor Ostrom uh, established, and also this idea of having conscious conversations ethical about ethics. And you definitely it was Garrett Hardin who, you know, kind of um, talked about um, the commons, it, that was his issue. If you have shared a shared resource, like he was talking about land, that you'll have some freeloaders who will be using it without um, any commitment. And that's the whole purpose of the, not the whole purpose, but one significant purpose of Eleanor Ostrom's eight governance principles that you gain that there are consequences and that individuals who are freeloading can actually be kicked off of the commons. They, they agree to that. If, they, if they're part of the commons, one of the ultimate consequences um, is not being allowed to be part of it anymore. Oh, that's really interesting. So I'm gonna do one more follow-up question and then we'll open up to the questions of the group. Uh, because it, there was a question that we got early on that directly relates to this. So there's the problem of the overgrazed commons, right, that you need to protect against. But there's also the question of how do you cultivate the untapped commons um, that are resources that people aren't utilizing yet, and while also dealing with 
the opposite problem of overgrazed commons. And I hope well, that makes again, sense. I just want to um, emphasize again that we don't consider commons like a thing, land. That's not a commons. It's just a resource. It can be commonized or it can be um, commodified. <laughs> and when, it, when it's privatized, it's commodified. Um, so it's, it's, we're talking about how you organize that item or that resource, that commonwealth. So it's not, we don't say land is a commons. No, land is, a re is something out there. We make it. We give it definition by the way that we define it, use it, and um, so forth. So untapped commons, it doesn't really have that much meaning. Um, let's say, inform it's okay, information, let's say. Information has been commodified. It's getting harder and harder to get access to scholarly information um, because it's been commodified. So you have something like Im information and you, then you have private sector that's putting a value on it, selling it, um, giving a price to access it. So to um, commonize it is to open it. And so that's where the open access movement has started groups of individuals who are um, governing, managing um, information to give greater access. The internet's another, or the, actually the software is another aspect that has been commodified and groups are common, commonalizing it, making it open access. So, um, I guess, I guess what's going through my mind, because I live in Florida and my community just d averted a natural disaster that was created by um, a commodified, you know, private owned entity that went bankrupt 60 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And the disaster was going to affect not just the common, the, the land that they're on, uh, but also the bay. <laughs> and all the estuaries and all the animals in that. So I, I think one of the problems that when people have problems with capitalism, it's precisely because the uh, things have been commodified, but not the downside. The downside is, the com is, is that they're negatively impacting the commons, which comes back to the, how do you prevent overgrazing? And I'm putting that in air quotes for people who are just listening and not watching. Um, because that is a, a common problem that communities deal with is that there are people poisoning the commons. Like in our case, it was almost a radioactive disaster. So um, it, when I say poison, I mean poison, right? So how do we use common leadership of the commons to help us deal with these they're not going away, right? I mean, these things are baked into our, our system because it happened 60 years ago, right? Um, so how do we use the commons to help us deal with past violations of our commons, what everybody would consider the commons? Um, do you have any advice or? Well, there's a very intimate relationship, a necessary relationship between social movements and commons. They go together. And often social movements lead to the creation of commons. And in some cases, when things have been commodified, when they're poisoning us, you need a social movement. And the social movement is organized like a con they're self-organized, they're self-governed. So I think in some cases, the first step is to help create a social movement that's going to put pressure on various powers that are uh, maintaining the status quo and actually, you know, in poisoning us, and that, and those are often, I mean, those are often spontaneous. Once somebody starts, others will join in, and um, definitely, you know, they have a distributed leadership. They, they work toward um, both organizing to improve, but also organizing to um, force others who have power to make changes. So I think and that was that was really, really helpful. I mean, and I, I'm like thinking about what's happening locally and you just described what the response was. Uh, Elizabeth, do you want to open up the questions that we're seeing in the chat room? 
I sure will, because we've got a lot of great questions. Um, and I will start off with William Fuller's, um, who asks a doozy, and it's um, creating a new paradigm is heady stuff. How do you presume to bring along those who might rightly or not feel that they are being dispossessed? I have grave misgivings about your postulation of human cooperativeness. Okay, well, <clears throat> there's a there have been a lot of studies um, and um, by um, high level scholars, you know, that I I refer to them in my book um, that have shown that humans are more cooperative than competitive and more communal than individualistic. It's, it's kind of a myth, it's been a myth of capitalism that we're totally self, we just maximize our own uh, benefits. It's really not necessarily true. Although, um, you know, there are people that do that. <laughs> Maybe, I know there was one question that came by about psychopaths. I mean, there are certain leaders of corporations that they say 20% of all CEOs are psychopaths, but anyway. Um, so <laughs> um, how do you introduce this paradigm? I think if you read my book, it talks about how we commonize the world and it's basically our example and it's um, expanding commons um, that you, you change by um, showing the value of something that you don't, you know, destroy old systems and build new systems from the rubble. That you're you're pushing by by showing new values, and I think that process is really happening. If you look at the leadership literature, there's certainly been a shift to more um, shared and and communal um, types of relational leadership, um, breaking down this rigid schism between leaders and followers. I think if you look at organization development, again, there's more and more shift to flatter organizations, horizontal structures. I think there's something happening. And I think in the universal consciousness, the whole idea of care is really starting to be infused more and more care for our resources, care for each other. So it, it's a process. It's um, I think the commons, I, I look at in my book, a whole chapter on some of the major commons thinkers about their models of how we transition to a more common centric society. And it's definitely a process, little by little, um, and believing that humans are cooperative <laughs> and acting that way. And, um, you know, I guess our contention is eventually they'll be Um, thank you. Uh, what are uh, Stephanie asks? Um, what are the some of the best practices for increasing inclusion and including everyone? Um, you mean within an organization, or uh, I, I'm, let's talk about both within an organization and I think in general in society. So, for example, housing, right? Because it's been commodified, only people who can afford housing get to be housed. Um, so maybe within organizations and then more broadly in society. Right. Yeah, this has definitely been one of the main factors that has initiated the whole commons movement is how do we get included? Our decisions have been taken away from us and housing is a good example. And it, again, I'll go back to the issue of, again, social movements and um, forming more commons that, and also, and I don't know, there's debate in the commons literature about, about gaining political power, um, but um, certainly one, way of including more inclusion is gaining some kind of power so that the system can be changed somehow. So the incentives in the system can be changed such that um, things like housing uh, are more accessible to individuals and there's more ways of including people. I think in organizations, it's just a matter of leader, the, the, the positional leaders 
of allowing in all individuals in their organizations to have a voice and to exhibit leadership behavior. I don't know what the magic bullet is, but in society, I think it's continuing some of our social movements that are pushing against all the injustices. It's a matter of perhaps getting people in power that have more of a communal outlook. Um, I don't, I don't really, I wish I had a magic way, <laughs> I don't know. Well, those are good starting points. Thank you. Um, and then we also had a request um, from Letty that, or Letty, that um, if you could at some point put the reference for Catherine Baird in the chat. Um, uh, but the next question we'll go to is from Lisa, um, and she asks, what forces and influences enhance or enable Commons leadership, and what gets in the way? I have a sense that self-interested leadership that plays on fears is unfortunately a paradigm that can easily take over like a weed. So again, how, what were the forces that started Commons leadership is that the first no, part um, of the what things um, it factors enhance or or constrain Commons leadership. Okay. Yeah, we certainly have seen the whole issue of fear now currently in in society. We're all living in fear, but. Um, I guess in my book proleptic leadership. I argue really, I mean, prolepsis in the spiritual traditions is definitely a view of a positive future somehow. It, and, you know, some might argue it's faith oriented or that we have faith that humanity is improving somehow. And if you look through the sweep of history, you can see that in certain areas, in certain other areas, no, it seems to be getting worse. But I think part of that is having a, a allowing the, the glimpses of that positive future to infuse our everyday lives and our everyday way of dealing with individuals and dealing um, you know, with others and organizations. Um, I don't know, I'm involved in a group with Margaret Wheatley, who's you know, quite a famous uh, leadership guru who, um, believes, you know, we need to prepare for the end that civilization, especially the American civilization, possibly all of Western civilization is at a crashing point and that we need to be ready to help others through the collapse and who knows what the future will be. So there's different paradigms going on. So um, that her idea is how do you avoid the fear and shift it from fear to help um, when things are collapsing all around us, which it seemed to be with the with COVID, it just revealed how dysfunctional our systems are, <laughs> our economic, social, and just human relations are, and just the, the different way individuals perceived what was happening. Um, um, well, that's a great segue into um, William's second question, um, how to reconcile um, the, the need for public health versus the uh, anti-public health reactions um, for people who didn't want to wear masks, for example, because they felt it impeded their rights. Um, uh, do you have examples of how, how to sh make that shift? <laughs> how You mean how to change their mindset or to, I don't know. Yeah, how to, how to reconcile the, the preventive and precautionary actions with this assumption of an echo set of human proclivities. Um, whoa. And I know that's a hard one, right? I mean, no policymakers yet seem to have been able to figure it out. So maybe the webinar, we're not going to accomplish it either. Let me right. see if I can rephrase the question a little bit. Um, you know, the, 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 the challenge we're always going to have, right, is how to protect the commons from people who don't want to protect the commons right who don't view it as commons but as commodity right so that's in, in the language you were talking about it can either be commodity or commons and for those of us who recognize health or the covid situation as a commons situation right how do we deal with in a 
commons leadership sort of way, the, the need to move towards more commons idea thinking when there's a whole bunch of people who don't think about it as a commons issue. Yeah, part of that um, that schism that has been created is one of consciousness, is one of worldview, definitely the egocentric perspective of, of those who want to deny reality and don't want to protect others and the more communal perspective and how do you raise consciousness? That's a huge challenge of, um, but you know, part, <laughs> I mean, part of it has been because there's two different realities going on in the world and and the different consciousnesses, the different worldviews are being fed by information that sounds very reasonable on both sides. It's, um, the, you know, so how do you tap into that information that's feeding that ecocentric, that, that fear of losing one's individualism, that whole idea that we have rights, individual rights, and that um, if we're thinking about others, we're going to lose our individual rights. That's being fed by a lot of information that, that brings on experts and makes it sound very reasonable. So it's not, you know, somehow if we could um, commonize information somehow, I don't know how we can do that because, you know, I think, and that also in, information influences people's worldviews and their their level of openness. Um, so yeah, it makes me go back to something you said early on, which is, is you know, the a common, commonly led leadership has mm -hmm. to first identify what the ethical principles are, in order to even construct um, a common language through which they can have these conversations. Um, very quickly, we're about um, 12, 13 minutes before the end. Uh, so I just wanted to take a moment. So if, if anybody's interested, my company, Humanist Learning Systems, is the education partner. And uh, we offer HRCI and SHRM approved certificates for this session as well as a general certificate of uh, participation. So if you want, want either an HRCI or a SHRM or a general or all three, we need, I, I need your name, your first name, your last name, your email, and which certificates you want. You can ask for one or two or all three, but this is this session is approved for HRCI and SHRM, and I also provide a general certificate. So put that in the chat. Elizabeth? Sorry, I was typing all this. And I was just going to put that in the chat. Good for you. Um, you're a step ahead as usual. Um, I wanted to um, go to Gerard's question, who had a question about property rights. So, what are you know? Where does private property and private ownership fit into all of this? Are there limits? Um, would you recommend them? And would those be voluntary or imposed? Voluntary or imposed, you mean again for or against property rights? Or? I think the limits, like what is the role of policy and regulation in enforcing policy rights or in promoting, you know, commons um, movements? Well, well, that's also a question that's hard to answer totally from the perspective of the commons because we have a variety of different commons um, scholars and activists that come from highly different ideological perspectives and um, many who believe that we'll never transition to a common centric society as long as we have property rights because property rights by definition um, sep are individualistic and separate um, ownership so, um, oh my goodness. Um, Can I follow up I, that I question and, and take it? Because I think part of what's interesting to me about this whole conversation we've had and the questions we've had is that there's two levels to this, right? When I hear commons, I'm thinking about public policy and the commons, right? Whether it's the air or the water or whatever. But my understanding of your book and the, your idea of commons leadership is actually applied in an organizational sense, right? So if I'm in company A, how might I lead company A 
with a commons mindset as opposed to um, an extractive egocentric mindset. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know if you wanted to expand on that or not. Oh. Um, I guess Elizabeth can go to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to expand on that? Um, I mean, I, as I pointed out, commons, commons is, a, is a form of community. It's not a thing like air, water. It's, a, it's how, we, um, how we perceive and conceive and govern things like that. But I mean, definitely, if you look through history, you'll see de definitely when capitalism was overtaking feudalism and it started to enclose property, that there were a lot of um, spiritual leaders who were saying that these, these things are by definition commons, like air, water, because they were given to all of us. They weren't given to any individual. So therefore, no individual has the right to own it, to, to use it, to make a profit out of it. But um, so the way we distinguish now is through the way we govern certain um, things out there, certain commonwealths, we call them, things that are given to us by nature, but also human creations, like the internet, like, um, you know, information, whatever. Genes, genes is another thing that individuals have tried to commonize because companies have commodified genes now, and that seems totally irrational to humans. So I think it's, it's not only within an organization, it's just a way of approaching what is given to us in Commonwealth. I don't know how to say it. Um, thank you, Randall. Um, and I think we'll close with a, a question since this is a, a promoted by the International Leadership Association, um, a leadership question. How can leaders deal with multiple values from internal and external stakeholders at the same time um, to reconcile these different worldviews and values? It seems like a central um, a task that has to be accomplished for effective commons governance. Yeah, definitely. Um, again, I think it goes back to what are the found agreeing upon the foundational values and ethics of working together. And I think that um, Catherine Baird, and you know, she's the, the leader of the ethics game organization, the whole idea of conscious conversations. Um, Certainly you can't you know, necessarily change people's worldviews or outlooks, but if people agree to work together, there has to be certain areas that they're willing to agree to stand for and abide by. I don't think it's a matter of changing people's worldviews or whatever, but getting agreement on how we can work together and I don't know, Congress certainly is giving us a different example of that. So I don't know, we have no examples in our government. We have, so I don't know. I just look at it in the narrow sense of teams that I've been leading. <laughs> I don't. Randall, I... would you mind if I added something? No, please, this Kathleen. Is... Kathleen's a co-editor of our new book. <laughs> I... Hi, I just wanted to add something because I thought it might touch on the idea of the leadership and what does it take. Um, and I used in my chapter the example of Patagonia. So if anyone is not familiar with that company, I would suggest you go to their website. And even the website itself shows the perspective of the owner and the company in that you see on the tabs uh, products and activism. And so that company has um, a main value system that is very commons oriented. The owner says, we're in business to save the planet. So that's the first thing. The owner must have that mindset and have that perspective on what, what their goals are, what their, their actual intent in their business is. But the other thing that they do besides supporting activists, so people who go to buy Patagonia goods are, are sports people, rock climbers and so on. But it's all related to the resources that we're all associating with commons. And that gives people funding and connection with others wherever they are in their own community or around the world that share the same. So it starts building a network 
And I think that's what we're after when we're thinking, how do we shift a paradigm? It's building a critical mass and it is supporting business as well, but it's supporting for the good of the planet. And the last piece he says is, don't worry about your footprint, worry about your handprint. And therefore, when you say, how do I make sure everybody is buying in and we have these rights we want to uphold, that's, that's a company who looks at their whole supply chain all the way down to who grows the cotton. And we've heard a lot recently about chemicals in cotton growing and, and then the, bent, the, the um, conditions for workers and so on. Every, everything they sell, everything, every element that goes into whatever they sell, they have looked into it. So I think the bottom line there is the intent and then the relationality amongst all those that are participants within the supply chain. It creates a giant network and that's how paradigms change. So I, I hope um, you didn't mind me jumping in there. Um, I, was, I was trying to hold my tongue the whole time. <laughs> you did very well and that was fine. It was fine. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just wanna let everybody know, um, especially the people from ILA that are on, is that we got to interview Dean Carter from Patagonia last fall and we have a video of him, of his conversation um, on our website. Um, but I did wanna do, uh, I think we've got a time for final comments, Randall. So if, is there any last parting thoughts you wanna leave people with, words of wisdom, um, anything? I, well, I certainly want us to be hopeful that, I think that um, all over the world, people are clamoring for more voice, um, for more autonomy over their lives. Certainly uh, people now during the pandemic that didn't have enough to eat um, and depending, I mean, it's brought out a lot of local community individuals that are helping each other. So I think that that really has proven that humans are more um, cooperative than individualistic. But if individuals had more control over their basic needs, such as food, such as water, such as housing, um, that I think that it would be a better world. And um, I, you know, my, I just hope that we all start looking at the possibilities for us to have more say through the commons, through social movements, through the commons, and that we, continue to work that way and that we seriously look at the organizations we're within and make an effort to both look at ourselves, our own worldviews, our own values, and also work together to um, just slowly, slowly, um, you know, build up the impetus <laughs> to a more autonomous, more uh, caring, a more responsible world in which we take more responsibility for ourselves and for others. Well, thank you so much, Randall. Thank you for joining us. We really enjoyed your time here and so, so happy you agreed to join us today. I wanna to remind everybody that this has been the International Humanistic Management Association's Humanistic Management Professionals Lunch and Learn. And we do do this on a regular basis and you can find more at our website, humanisticmanagement.international. Um, all of the slides and all the materials that we talked about will be posted on a blog post on our website along with the video and we will email everybody with that information as well and we also want to thank once again our marketing partner International Leadership Association for helping us today. Thanks so much.